very much, John, and um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here um, to talk about um, French Baroque organ music, um, which um, seems to have taken over my life in the past 20 years or so. Um, and um, it's an area which is, I still find, in full of confusion as far as organists. And one, quality, so, and one of the reasons why I started researching the whole thing was that I felt there were so many questions to be answered and I did my best to, to answer them as best I could. Of course, the more you research, the more you find out what is what cannot be known and what is not known. So, so the indecision has increased manifold since I've written the book and done the editions. However, um, there are reasons why French Baroque organ music, particularly that period from Louis Brown, 1660 or so, um, up to the revolution in 1789 is, is really very, um, very misunderstood and um, not at all well known. And there are four reasons for this, I think. First of all, there are no French Baroque organs in this country. Uh, there are many organs on, um, on which one can approximate the sounds um, and be able to judge how I I succeed on the same sort of this afternoon, um, but there are no sort of authentic French Baroque organs or, or copies of them, which I think is a great shame actually. The second reason is the, the liturgical context has completely changed, um, not only from the Protestant Reformations in the 16th century, but also in the Roman Catholic Church as well, um, uh, where the alternative organ mass. That is, each phrase of the Roman Catholic Mass divided between some plain chant, alternately with organ pieces, was banned in 1903. And therefore, the, the liturgical context is, um, um, has really passed us by. The third reason why it's misunderstood is that there is very little indication of the music or the information that we want to know. Um, pieces are either titled by their registration, de l'Ordre de Granger, well we can look up what a Granger is and pull out the right spots and hear the right sounds, but there's no indication of tempi, there's no indication of the style of music that, um, that this particular piece is written in. Um, or the titles refer to textures, um, duo, trio and fugue, for example. Well we can see if a piece is written in two parts, it's all duo, so that's not a great deal of help. On the other hand, the particular styles themselves, the genres, changed um, throughout the period. And we have a, an increasing emphasis on styles of dance, for example, in the duo and the trio. Um, so therefore, if you want to play a particular piece, a uh, particular duo by François Couperin, one has to ask the question, what style is this written in? Is it written in style of minuet, or a or a basakai, or whatever? Um, and if so, that tells us a lot about the tempi um, and the way the phrase it is. Um, the fourth reason is that there were performance practices in France uh, that really go against our earliest piano lessons. François Coupin writes that the French um, don't play quavers equally um, and therefore they, they change things. So what looks like a row of quavers in a particular piece of Kubra might well be played unequally. Where do we do this? How do we do this? How are we In what context? There's another area of research there. Um, whereas he says, Kubra says, the Italians might be write the notes in the true time values in which they wrote it. So we're on safer ground uh, with Italian music. But François Couperin's mission in life, for example, was to unite the Italian and French styles. So another area of research um, would uh, suggest that we delve into the style that Couperin was writing. Is Couperin writing in the style of a French minuet? Or is he writing in the style of Italian Corrente, for example. And if we can make those decisions, of course there's a completely different technique and completely different performance practices. So the whole area is really very uncertain.
So this afternoon I'm going to talk about a few issues um, and, um, and I hope you've all got the, the, the sheets of paper in front of you. Um, I can show you um, so this is a specification of a typical French organ, you can start with the organ itself. Um, there's a specification of two particular organs that um, I've quoted here. One Saint Louis de Tampoli in Paris and one in Houdon near Chartres, a much smaller organ. Um, as, as you see, both of them have the statutory uh, choruses, the Plangeur and the Grange. Um, and uh, essentially, if you look over to the, the next page, you'll see a typical case. This is 1636. This is Saint Etienne du Mont case, anyway. The organ inside it is no longer French Baroque. But it gives you a good indication that there we have the Grand Orb standing underneath the rose window and the positive organ. And this defines the two essential components. Um, and um, the, the positive was very much a miniature version of the Grand Orb. So the Grand Orb based on, say, a 16th foot principle, um, the positive based on an 8th foot principle, but both containing a plethora of blue stops right up to mixtures and reeds. Now the other keyboards were essentially solo keyboards. The Racine, um, situated above the Grand Hall, um, containing uh, a cornet and a trumpet. Um, the echo organ above that, um, similarly. And the pedal organ as well was very much a solo keyboard for playing the plain chant reads, reads on the plain chant um, uh, at 8th of pitch, whereas the Grand Hall was at 16th of pitch. This is completely different from the German conception of the pedal, which essentially was the fundamental base of the harmony, etc. In France, it was merely a solo key. Yes, it could play the bass on a sensitive AC, um, but at 8th of pitch on a flute, um, uh, whereas the, the Royal Hall was, um, was based on 16th of pitch. Um, the next uh, illustration is a sort of exploding view of the French organ, um, looking from, uh, it's a sort of, um, you can see the back of the console at the bottom, the case at the top, um, you can see the, the mounted cornet in the middle standing on its own wind chest. Um, just about in the middle of the picture. And then the next illustration is um, uh, from Don Bedos, uh, 1770 or so, where you have the four keyboards, positive, wrong wall, noisy, and echo. And this is entirely typical of, uh, of the French world period. Notice the pedal wall, which is very, very limited compared with the um, and what we have here, for example, um, uh, there are many buttons that come out of the floor. So, in a sense, playing it, one cannot use a German pedal technique or an English pedal technique. One has to completely relearn those pedal technique. And this is very interesting. No eagles, obviously. And often, um, more often than not, over the shafts, there will be an iron bar so the organist can rest his foot there when not otherwise employed. Um, so playing C sharp demands very great precision. You have to sort of fit your foot underneath the bar and then press the right one. Um, so it, it just demands a completely different pedal technique. When I was when I was young learning the organ, it was Henry Ellington's organ method, his pedal technique, um, and complicated diagrams of heels and toes. Of course this doesn't matter doesn't work at all on the French Baroque organ, not at all. Furthermore, um, when I was um, at Sala Cathedral, which is a 1752 organ, um, I found that um, the pedal board was displaced by about five notes, so that um, the middle C on the pedal board corresponded to treble C on the pedal board, and this upset me terrifically. I had to completely relearn my technique within 24 hours. Um, and I just about managed it, but you have to be flexible. There's no good in 
imposing your own metal technique on an organ for which it's not designed. Just a look. Um, the next illustration is a sort of um, um, exploded view of, um, of where things are in society. Positive on the left, um, the um, mountain cornet, fairly up in, in the middle, or at the top, the grand hall, um, surrounding all that, the um, basin on a higher chest, and then the echo somewhere in the middle of the organ. Of course, all of these registration instructions um, are defined. The, the idea of an organist in, say, 1700 playing uh, was that he could actually play any organ anywhere and still pull out the same, same stops. So there was a, a unity of design right across the country. Um, and I reproduced some, some of the registration. And I'll start by, by playing a, a plangeur. Um, we have the registrations, um, the flue stops, starting 16 foot, ending up with the two mixtures, the furniture and the sound bar, all up to the positive. There were two sorts of plangeur. The, the raw plangeur, fairly harmonic, slow moving, but also the positive plangeur which I believe was more akin to the to Carters of Froberger, um, much more virtuosic, um, much more improvisatory, um, contrasting between, um, uh, between that and the Bond or the Plancher. I think the, the Plancher I'm going to play now from Clarenbo's second suite is a very good example um, of the difference between the two subgenres. Bach's well-tempered clavier and the art of fugue, 
and they know about views. But French organ views had a completely different uh, set of parameters. First of all, um, they had to be very short because they had to substitute for one particular phrase in the mass. Um, Nivez said that the fugue subjects had to be vocal in quality, uh, often based on the chant, which preceded it. Um, and of course, counter subjects were, were never used in, in French organ music. Um, and whereas the, the German, German philosophy of writing fugues is to explore as many different contrapuntal um, possibilities inherent in the subject, um, using augmentation, diminution, counter subjects, several of them, episodes, to make one piece of music as long as possible, uh, based on one short subject. The French philosophy was to cram as many entries in as you possibly could, um, without making it too long, because of the mass, obviously. Um, and this particular view by Clarenbeau is a really good example. It's only 29 or 30 bars long, but I can count over 20 fugal entries. So the whole, the whole thing is, is one of density and rhetoric. And each of those few subjects is ornamented in a slightly different way um, to provide variety. So it needs a different kind of listening if you're used to listening to fugues by Bach. Then it's the wrong way of listening to this music. You have to listen every bar uh, to see exactly what's happening, take a note of all the, um, the entries that are, that are coming into it. Just demands a completely different way of listening. And the registration for the fugue graph, which is this is an example, um, uh, consists of reed stops actually, trumpet and with its foundations all uh, probably.
or in fact with a duo piece in two parts. And um, this was a genre in which gradually through the late 17th century, more and more dance styles became incorporated. Um, we find um, duos in the style of Minuet, uh, Gavotte, Passapier, Moray, all sorts of things. Of course, they weren't dances themselves that would contravene ecclesiastical prescription. Um, they don't have double bars, um, and they're never called Minuet, in, uh, a duo in the style of Minuet. That would have been um, uh, not, not acceptable at all in the church. But nevertheless, these dance styles do invade the organ, the organ genres. And, um, uh, and uh, this particular one, um, by André Raison, Raison quotes in his preface that before you play a particular piece, you should look up the time signature and the style of the piece to see whether it relates to an Alamon, a Bourbon, a Saraband, a Jig, in many senses, the Bourbon de Forgeron. Scholars and players have been wondering what on earth the Bourbon de Forgeron is, the movement, the style of the blacksmith, that's what it means literally. Um, and um, uh, <coughs> I was uh, pondering this as I was examining the whole of Brazil, and I managed to to find examples of every different style in, in the hundred pieces I was looking at, except this one duo which I couldn't place, then I realized could this be the piece that he refers to as Mouvement de Fourchon? And then I remembered the opera by Louis Isis, um, called the Musician's Opera at the time, and there there is a scene, um, the Entree des Fourchons, and I find that Raison is recomposed this uh, particular piece. So I believe this duo is in the, the style of Blacksmith.
The next, the next drawer I'd like to introduce is after the Récit. Récit means nothing more or nothing less than solo. And uh, there were solos for the, the cornet, the jeunetiers, the trombone, the voisin men, the trumpet. Um, I've chosen to play this particular uh, Récit en Thai um, for the trombone. Uh, I think it's one of François Couperin's deepest pieces, actually. And um, I think that the, the registration suits 16 and 8 on the keyboard um, and the front wall with its uh, accompanying moves. And also this is a place where uh, the pedal, the 8 foot pitch, uh, is usefully employed. The next race is a basta trompet, um, and from looking at all the examples of basta trompets in the repertory, there's no, uh, I have no doubt that it was all derived from the military fanfares uh, that were written down in 1636 and published by Marin Mersenne in the Book of Instruments. Um, it makes use of the, the trumpet stop, and um, the, um, the, the French trumpet. Um, it, it, as opposed to the German trumpet, crescendo downwards um, and sort of tapered off to the, to the top. And actually, the reeds on this organ do something like that, which is uh, very gratifying indeed. This is a master trumpet uh, by Clara from his first suite. Thank uh you. -huh. 
another genre, not mentioned yet, is the four law, um, a piece that, um, that relies on the foundation source, the fruits and the principles of the, of the organ. This is by Louis Marchand. Marchand was the most famous virtuoso French organist at the time, but he's had a very bad press, primarily because he undertook to, um, to make a competition with no less than J.S. Bach at a court in, uh, in Dresden in 1717. And um, Marchand didn't appear. Bach was there with the assembled company, including ladies and um, royalty. And Marchand was nowhere to be seen until it had been discovered that he'd taken the early coach back to Paris that morning. Now, I think Marchand's had a very bad time on this because there's no doubt to me that with someone like J.S. Bach improvising a few on the last call, um, there's no way, in front of German audience as well, there's no way that Marchand would have succeeded. On the other hand, if the competition had held, been held in Paris, in front of the king and so forth. And there's no doubt in my mind that J.S. Bach's music would have been termed far too artificial, far too long, and Marshall would have got hands down. So Marshall's had a bad time of it. But this particular piece, which is from a, a manuscript in Versailles, um, where it doesn't have a title even, but um, I strongly think that it's a, a formal and perhaps written for the, the most sacred part of the Mass, uh, the Ambassador. And um, you can hear all sorts of dissonances here, which seem to be um, influenced by the elevation of the Cartes of Frescobaldi. <laughs> Um, fragments 
in, in this particular repertoire, um, that are reminiscent of this Lully opera. Um, the main theme in Lully is in 3 8, Lupra writes in 3 4. And for years I played it with the thought of um, ceremonial religious uh, processions around the church of Saint Gervais. But knowing that it's a sort of written down improvisation on themes from, from Lully's opera, and of course Louis XIV was very fond of opera and liked a good tune and tapped his foot, etc. It seems to me that this was um, a sort of hoping for preferment to one of the royal organists, which Couperin came uh, some years later. Lalonde himself was already appointed to Versailles at that time, um, and he uh, was kind enough to write a certificate saying that he recommends Francois Couperin's new organ masses, written and uh, published at the age of 21, by the way, so he was a young man. Um, and this seems to be, um, this particular offertoire seems to me to be um, full of sort of operatic um, tentacles, if you like, operatic influences. And I started playing in a completely different way. Well, I hope you enjoy it anyway. Uh, after this, um, I propose that we, um, we, we've got time, we have a few questions. If you'd like to ask any questions about any aspect of the performance practice, notes in the yard, orientation, who names? Uh, you name it, but um, I'd be happy to, uh, to partake in further discussion. Meanwhile, here's Kupra's offer to ask you the